Um, our next speaker is Stuart Manning of Shotcrete, and my background prior to waterproofing was actually concrete. It was sort of my baby. I really enjoyed admixtures and various concrete supplies. So I'm looking forward to this. It allows me to get my concrete, concrete geek on. So if we could welcome Stuart to the stage, please. Thank you all. Um, thank you for lunch. That was, uh, was, was pleasant. Um, I don't know how much of you know anything about spray concrete, so I'm going to try and sort of uh, do a little bit of a, a, an overview um, so that you can um, fill in any gaps um, before we start talking a bit more technically about it. Um, for my sins, I, I head up uh, Shotcrete Services' technical side. Um, we work nationally, we work globally, um, predominantly spraying concrete, but we have ready mix side of the business as well. So uh, we're, we're quite diverse, and we also get involved in tunnelling, HS2 being a classic example. So there's two basic processes of spraying concrete. Um, we refer that to those as the wet process and the dry process. Um, the hint is in the name. Um, the wet process um, uses a hydrated material, and the, the dry process uses a, a dry material. Um, they used to be referred to as uh, gunite, um, shotcrete, various other terminologies. Um, I also have been involved in the Spray Concrete Association and um, we, we like to just re refer to the two processes by the, the wet and the dry names. So the wet process, we're using uh, a hydrated wet material delivered by a ready mix truck normally. Um, and uh, that, that goes into the back of our, our shock creating machine, our pump, and that is pumped and conveyed um, hydraulically to the nozzle. Um, at the nozzle, we're then adding compressed air. Um, in tunneling, we might add uh, another opportunity. We might add um, uh, an additive, uh, an accelerator, to allow us to, to build out um, higher, higher proportions of, of material. Um, compressed air, we need around 400 CFM, so it's quite a, quite a high amount of air. It's great for, for, for large volume um, projects and the likes of that. The dry process, as in the name, we're using a dry material. So we're putting a, a, a dry blend of, of material into the hopper. That might include the fibers. It might include some polymers. It might include uh, any other admixtures we want. But it's predominantly going into that hopper dry. Um, generally, in, in a bagged format, it can be in bulk silo. So we can have a bulk silo on site and, um, and, and, and position the machine straight under the silo. We convey the material by air. So that's the fundamental difference. Uh, rather like grip blasting, the material is sent down the pipe at around about 100 miles an hour um, and out of the nozzle, um, but it's, it's, it's not been hydrated at all. We're hydrating it at the nozzle. So this process generally creates more dust. And if you've seen spray concrete and you've seen it looking quite dusty, it's because they're probably using the dry process. With the wet process, we've already hydrated the material at the batching plant in the back of a truck um, so we get a lot less atmospheric pollution. Um, these machines could be electric or, um, or, or air powered, um, and generally you would e need an even larger compressor. We're trying to me me mechanize our industry now. Um, there's certainly on, on the wet spray, um, the, the pipes are fairly heavy. Um, we limit the aggregate sizes, we'll, we'll look at mixes in a minute to uh, a 10 millimeter aggregate. Um, one of the main reasons for that is that um, we would end up with uh, a much bigger pipe and it's a handling issue. Our guys can't hold a four inch pipe. They can hold a, a two inch or three inch pipe. So the use of uh, robotics is now becoming ever more present um, in what we're doing. Um, classic example like here where we've got a huge pile of wool. Um, we can achieve much higher outputs um, uh, and the nozzleman's not got such a strain on him. He's a chap there in the orange, so he's just on his little PlayStation box there. Um, he can see exactly what he's doing, um, and he's in a position of safety. Um, and, uh, and then we've got radio communication to, uh, to our concrete pump, which could be positioned 100 metres away. On the really big projects, on, on the tunnelling jobs, we upscale. We have an even bigger machine. Um, this machine would have an integral concrete pump in it. It would have admixture tanks on it. Um, you can see the length of the boom and, and the end of it can, can slide backwards and forwards. So that enables a nozzleman to stand away from, from the excavated material. 
So he's always in a position of, of safety. He's not standing uh, underneath the, the exposed ground. Um, and uh, and, and it, it's, again, gives us a good high output. So we could be spraying 30, 40 cubic meters uh, a, a, a day with this sort of outfit. Um, with the big machines there, you know, it would be even higher than that. So let's look at, just quickly, the properties of spray concrete. Um, it's no different to, to, to normal cast concrete um, in a lot of respects. We struggle to get lower strengths, so below 25 MPA, because we're running a high cement content. We need a, a high paste content to allow the concrete to stick and to perform. Um, so we're generally uh, on the higher strength end. Our water cement ratios are generally slightly lower, so 0 0.35 to 0 0.4. Density should be the same as a vibrated concrete. Um, water permeability, uh, slight typo, it's less than 20 mil on a standard concrete. We can get lower than that with, um, when we start putting admixtures in there. We mentioned that the aggregate size, generally a 10, 10 mil ag, um, ag maximum. Um, and we can go for, for any blend. So SEM1, SEM2, SEM3 blends. Everyone is pushing eco concrete now. So you know, we're looking more and more to try and up the blends um, and reduce our carbon footprint. Um, admixtures, fairly standard, so we will use a, a WRA or a super plasticizer with harder in our mixes, much as you would have in a tra traditional concrete. And um, we, can, we can use a lot of waterproof admixtures, such as, as the Pud Loser Seekers and, and Master Builders. Um, Caltite is one that, that we can't use because we just get a lot of atmospheric pollution, especially in the confined space. So the sort of structures that we can build with spray concrete, um, fairly standard structures, you'll all be happy with. Uh, basements, you guys are more into, but the tunnels, the, the stations, water tanks, all of those sort of stuff can, can, can be sprayed um, using our process. As a business, we, we spray around 85% of our work is basements, so a high percentage. If we take tunnels out, because tunnels are, are very unique in, in, in our business and, and quite high value, but the majority of our work, the bread and butter work that we do up and down the country every day, gangs of men, are spraying basements. Typical examples such as this. So uh, could be a piled walk, con contig, secant, sheet pile. Could be some reinforcing in front of that. And then we'll put a concrete, spray concrete finish on that. It could be anything from 100 mil to 300 mil thick. Um, and working in various combinations. So water tightness, that's what we're, we're, we're talking about. And how do we achieve it? Well, the easy bit is the concrete. Concrete is, is watertight. Whatever combination we use, a SEM1, a SEM2, or SEM3, um, if we, we look at the water cement ratio and we keep it within these bounds, the concrete itself will be watertight, whether it's cast or whether it's sprayed. So we know we can achieve uh, or get a watertight concrete. The issue, the hard part that we all have, is constructing it to be watertight. And that's where we have to look at any possibility of through-going cracks, um, casting joints and the likes of that. That's where we're going to have our leak. Our leak paths are going to come from those elements. So if we're looking at trying to create watertight structures, we're given some assistance. Designers have uh, various standards to work to. So Eurocode 2, um, EN1992 Part 3. Um, this, will, this will give a designer um, targets to aim for. So if we want to minimize crack width in our concrete structures, then we're going to look at um, increasing rebar, putting another up, couple of, uh, of, of design aspects into that to try and minimize crack width, which is then going to minimize any potential uh, leakage. You'll notice there that, that, that we, we can allow for some cracks, which will supposedly self-seal. Um, spray concrete, we have a high cement content, so we do get a good uh, a, a proportion of uh, self-sealing. But when we're looking at basement structures especially, our leak's going to be acceptable. Is a client going to accept that we've got a damp patch and, and it's okay? Or we've got some, some water coming through a crack. It'll self-seal. All is good. Generally, it's always a point of concern. So uh, grades, I'm sure you're all familiar with from NHBC. They're giving us guidance as well. So we have to um, design our spray concrete structures to, to meet these various grades, and these again are giving us options to work with. So denoting what sort of um, water tightness we need in different structures, how are we going to achieve this um, with spray concrete? 
So the most important thing is, is our joints and how we, as I said before, how we, we prevent water coming in at various places. Now we as a company have done a lot of work with um, Pudlow and with Seeker, um, looking to, to, to try and create the best practices in our industry um, and, and making sure that all our Spray Concrete Association members can con construct uh, a decent structure that, that's going to be watertight. Um, in this particular photo, it's, uh, it's a trial panel. Um, so we've got a, a kicker joint. Uh, we put a waterproof membrane up the back and we sealed that because we're hydrostatically going to test this, this panel. Um, the injection pipe there, um, we're actually using to inject water to, to hydrostatically load this panel and this joint. Um, we've got a, hydro, uh, a hydrophilic water bar in there as you would in a, in a standard structure and that's been stuck down with uh, hydrophilic mastic. Um, and in this particular trial, we, we, we looked at different um, ways of preparing the joints. So some were plain grip blasted, some had a uh, waterproof membrane, um, a slurry coats on there, um, and some were just left as is. So when we took a core through that sample, um, we can see the, the, the actual joint mark. Um, so the lower proportion was the kicker, the top section is a spray concrete. As I would expect, you can't see any difference between the two concretes, they both look exactly the same. Um, we can see um, laser dot. we can see the hydrophilic mastic we can see that the, obviously the hydrophilic water bar we can see the fixing going into the to the kicker that's been fully encapsulated by the shotcrete and our injection pipe and here was a bit of hydrophilic uh, mastic that was that was uh, holding the, the the membrane on so we injected water into here and we wanted to see did we get any any material out of this joint and we did this for a number of number of different types uh, to see which joints perform best to allow us to, to, to then um, create these specifications. Normal day joints um, with spray concrete are slightly different. So we, we don't tend to spray to a stop end. One of the, one of the disadvantages of that, if we, if we are forced to spray to a stop end on a basement, is we're spraying generally against a piled wall. So piled cusps are uh, the demon. We never know how big they're going to be. Um, pile spacings can be tight, they can be far apart. So our volume for a panel can vary massively. We can't just cube it up and say, right, it's 14 cube from end to end. Um, when we're spraying, we, we want to, to spray till, till, till the end of the concrete load. We don't want to say, right, we're now going to tip two or three cube because we, we haven't been able to accurately calculate the exact volume we need. Um, so when we're spraying, I've done a lot of work with, with the type of joints and the best joint we can have in spray concrete terms, and you can see the, uh, the type of surface we get when we leave it as sprayed, um, is, is a very good um, coarse substrate. Um, so we generally make sure that we, we, we're always leaving a 45 degree angle from the front face to the back face. We're not putting a, a right angle joint in there. Um, we're also, if we've got an end end, we ideally want to be at 45 degrees, so we don't want to just, just stop with a vertical line. And when we're spraying, that, that's, that's the best way because we can, we can create our rebound ramp along the bottom, so, so for when we start spraying again, we're not gonna encapsulate rebound. We then come up at an angle, um, and it doesn't matter where we, whether we get to the top or we don't get to the top, um, as long as we leave it all as sprayed. Um, we can then trowel a slight section in the middle, and that allows us to stick our water bar on, and then the next day, the next load, then we can just uh, blow it all off and, and spray again. So, um, and again, we tested these joints to see um, which way, uh, which, which joint preferences were better. Did we need to slurry coat it? Do we leave it as sprayed? Do we put water bar in? So again, if we take a core through uh, a joint, um, I don't believe any of you can see the joint. Um, I can't from stood up here, but it would have been straight through here. So we can't see any trace of the joint here. We can see the rebar's been fully encapsulated. We've got good dense shotcrete everywhere we can see here so, so, so that we know we've got a homogeneous uh, concrete. We've got our uh, mastic, hydrophilic mastic, which has stuck the, uh, the water bar down uh, and kept it in place. It's very important when we're positioning the water bar and when we're spraying it that the nozzle is spraying directly onto it because we don't want to blow it away. We've done trials with, uh, with mesh covered water bars um, with, with mixed results. Sometimes it holds the, the water bar and prevents it from doing its job. Uh, other times um, it, it, it's, a, it's a good solution. But we've found that just with the hydrophilic mastic, as long as it's stuck down well and with good training uh, uh, and nozzling, 
then uh, you get a, a great result. The hardest point we have, and, and this is the same whether it's cast concrete or sprayed concrete, is our capping beam or soffit joint. If we're casting a wall, we'll letterbox it, we'll fill it up with concrete, but that concrete, the weakest point on that wall panel is going to be that top joint. It's good, the, the concrete's going to, to shrink a little bit away from the capping beam, away from the joint, um, and we get the same with spray concrete. So we spend a lot of time looking at how we can improve joints along the top it, soffit um, and, and, and under capping beams, and that's uh, looking at the quantity of steel, looking at whether, again, we put a slurry coat on there, do we just leave it grit blasted, how can we improve the joint? And my two pennies worth is along the top um, is, is to put an injectable pipe in there. Because if you do get a problem, then it's very easy to, to, to seal that by post-injection. Um, you may well get a joint, and it's good all the way along. But if you don't, and you do get an issue, it's a lot easier if the pipe's in there, um, and we can post-inject it. Um, if we're con con constructing that traditionally, we may well leave a gap and then dry pack it but a dry pack is still going to give us a, a potential uh, a leak zone through there. So looking at some of the, the, the quality items we have as a, as a specialist contractor, um, we're giving a, a, a specification from a client. Um, we've got a strength requirement that we need to make. Um, so we as a, as a contractor would design that mix to make sure it fulfills all of those um, criteria, whether it's a DC classification, um, strength classifications, anything else that we have to do. Um, the nozzleman is, is key. He's cr the critical part of the process. So training of those, those operatives is, is, is really important. Um, but also training of his team, because he can't, he can't work on his own. He's like a welder. Um, he needs to know what he's welding. He needs to have the equipment, the right equipment that he can weld with, and he needs to, to have uh, uh, enough room to do his weld. And if he does that, he's going to get a good weld. Well, if he, if he does that, he's going to get a, a, good, a good spray concrete result. Um, so you can, again, this is one of the trial panels that we were doing. I think you can see some, some, some water bar in there and the likes of that. Um, and then we, as I say, we, we hydrostatically tested this. Substrate, well, the same as if we're casting. It needs to be clean. It needs to be uh, either scabbled or grit blasted, so we've got at least half a chance of getting a good bond. We do get a good bond with spray concrete because we've got a high cement content and because the stuff's coming out at such velocity. Um, so we would expect a, a, a one to one and a half MPA tensile bond strength um, between uh, our shotcrete and, uh, and, and, a, and a concrete substrate. The reinforcement's important as well. It must be fixed rigidly. We don't want it to, to be flopping about and moving everywhere. Um, and the size and spacing of that reinforcement is really important. Um, so we quite often get involved in, in early contractor design. Um, some of the, some of the lar larger contractors we work with regularly will, will get us involved early so we can have um, uh, input into, into speaking to designers about um, rebar congestion, uh, what can we spray around to, to enable us to, to get a, a, a good uh, end product. So if we look at the process of, of creating a, a, a structural basement wall, um, we would fix the steel. Um, once we've done that, we would uh, install our profile rails. So most jobs uh, would be to line and level. Um, these, are, these are vertical rails put in uh, at around about two and a half meters uh, spacing. We then spray the first layer, which brings us out to the front face of the reinforcement, the bulk layer. So we, 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 we create that, um, we spray it all out, and once we've done that, the, the guys might just go over lightly with a the trowel, they're cleaning the greed rails, and just remove any snots, because we don't want any, any lumps that, on this panel here that, that when we screed it, we're going we're gonna to bump into. Once we've, once we've done our bulk, uh, our bulk fill, We'll then come through uh, and start the finishing operation. Uh, and, and that's normally done in, in hit and miss panels, as you can see there. So the guys will, will screed off the, the front face, so we overspray it slightly. Um, and once we've done that, it gives us a, a nice flat substrate to line and to level, um, perfectly suitable for, for putting on uh, membranes. Um, if it's going to be a stuck membrane, then uh, it may require a, a float finish, but generally this, is, this would be the, the sort of the run-of-the-mill uh, finish, most cost-effective finish we can do um, when we're looking at uh, uh, the use of membranes on top of, uh, of a concrete. 
if we want to trail it smooth, we can. So once they'd screeded it, uh, the guys would then go over there with a plastic float, uh, rub the surface up, and that would give us a, a render-like finish to, to plus or minus three mil. Um, we can incorporate other, other bits, um, sort of shadow gaps and joints and the likes of that, and if we've got inclusions, we would, we would just put some shuttering around the, any doorway openings and the likes of that. Testing, um, it's a ready-mix concrete uh, for, for, the, for the wet process. Uh, so slump and flow, um, both are critical. If we are not using any admixture, then uh, our slump is critical. So we need to be running at around about 80, 80 slumps, something like that, because we want to make sure that we can, we can stack the concrete behind the steel. We're not getting any slumping. Um, and that allows the guys to, uh, to, to, to complete their job. If we're pumping a long way, uh, we've got a job at the moment in London in the Ritz where we're pumping around about 150 meters into a basement. So we will up the, 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 the consistency of the material to an S3, uh, and then we will pull it back at the other end by adding an admixture to that to stiffen it at the nozzle. That's really to give the guys the, the flexibility and the ability to pump down a three inch pipe that sort of length. It does add a, a cost to us, the admixture, so we, we try and keep away from that because because obviously we're, we've got to be competitive to shattered concrete. Um, so consistency is important. Testing of the base mix, um, we need to check that the, the ready mix supplier, if it's not, not ourselves, but even if it is ourselves, uh, is giving us what we say um, we think we're getting. So if we've specified that mix, we want to check that the base mix is, is correct. If we want to test the actual spray concrete itself, um, the only way uh, to do that is through core testing. Um, if we're looking at a watertight structure, we don't want to be coring holes in it, then we would spray a panel that would replicate the structure. So same amount of steel in it, um, in, a, in a panel, square panel next to the area we're spraying. The guys would spray that panel and then they'd carry on with their, with their daily duties. We could then core that panel. We can check that, that core or those cores for quality, for density, for um, um, encapsulation of rebar and the likes of that, and then we can get a compressive strength result on that. And if we need permeability, then we can also test that core for permeability as well. Um, we can also do flexural testing. Generally, we're in association with, with uh, fibred concrete, so if we're using steel fibers and no rebar, then uh, there be, might be a, a, a flexural testing requirement on a, on a project. So for that, we'd have to spray a panel, diamond cut some beams out of the panel, and then uh, complete the flexural testing. And sometimes as well, um, we may be required a bond test. Generally, bond tests would be for, for concrete repair applications and stuff like that. Um, so common sort of basement solutions, right at the very bottom, uh, the simplest option uh, is uh, a, just a shotcrete facing to a par wall, whether that's secant or contiguous. Um, lightweight option, so a lightweight mesh on there, uh, D49, something like that and a nominal 50 mil maybe to the face of the pile, a little bit deeper in the cusps. That, that facing is not going to take any load. It's going to retain the, 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 the material, uh, and it's going to give us an aesthetic finish. To prevent any hydrostatic loading, we would want to put in, sorry, we'd want to put in some uh, pile drain uh, every second or every third pile, depending on the ground conditions, and making sure that that's free draining either through wheat pipes along the base or, or leave tails out so it goes into a, into a gravel drain. Um, so non-structural solution, a lot of bridge abutments, but we've, we've done basements with those as well, external areas of, of car parks and the likes of that, um, and you can get uh, a reasonably uniform finish from that. Moving up to the sort of more structural options, um, as we saw earlier, where we are um, looking at one or two layers of steel that's, that's been designed by the designer to, to act as, uh, a, as a, a, a shear wall in front of the, the piles. Um, could be, as I say, contigs, secants, or, or sheet piles. Um, different, different grades of finish, so we might need to go for the wood float or for the, for the screeded, or the aspirate as well if it's for an external area, light well area, etc. cetera. Um, so we can do a, a, what we call a cut and flash if, if a client wants a nice flat profile. So we would, we would screed it, and then we would spray over it again just to give it some uniformity, to give it that sort of pebble-dashed effect that you can see on the top there. If we're looking at um, how it spray concrete works with membranes, um, if, we're, if we're going with a sandwich membrane, so uh, the likes of a, a bentonite mat or, or something like that, then we 
would spray a leveling coat first. We've done a lot of work on that where we've tried bentonite products and, and there's been voids behind in, in pile cusps and stuff and, it, and it, it can swell into those and it doesn't work quite as well. So our preference would always be to put a leveling coat on first, then we've got a flat surface to apply that membrane to. Um, doesn't necessarily be screeded, it could be as sprayed, but it's, it's flat enough for us to get the membrane on and we can get a good joint then into the slab if we've got to put a, a, a if it's joint joint to the, the, the membrane under the slab and we haven't got sort of it ruckles in the piles. Um, and then we would put the steel on and then we would spray uh, the structural wall on top of that. Um, we also uh, spray membranes as well, cementitious membranes. So on some sites that we'll, we'll actually put a, a cementitious membrane on and then we would spray the, the, the shock on top of that. Um, so we've got a number of different options to us. Um, if you're looking at surface applied membranes, obviously the, the, the cavity drain would go on the, on, on the, the screeded shotcrete. Uh, and if it was a, 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 a stuck on membrane or a painted membrane, then uh, the manufacturers would advise us of what of the client, what sort of finish they want. So do they want a closed finish or, or, or can it take a, a slightly coarser finish? So um, that's, that's how we sort of uh, incorporate the membranes into, uh, into what we do. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, if there's any questions to come, but well, uh, I'm sure you, if you have got some, you can fire them at me when I'm sat down uh, on the chair. But uh, thank you very much um, for listening and uh, go from there.